Good day and welcome everyone to the first quarter fiscal 2022 earnings call for Commercial Metals Company. Today's materials, including the press release and supplemental slides that accompany this call, can be found on CNC's Investor Relations website. Today's call is being recorded. All participants will be in a listen-only mode. Should you need assistance, please signal a conference specialist by pressing star then zero. After the company's remarks, we will have a question and answer session. To ask a question, you may press star then one on a touchstone phone. To withdraw your question, please press star then two. I would like to remind all participants that during the course of this conference call, the company will make statements that provide information other than historical information and will include expectations regarding economic conditions, effects of legislation, U.S. steel import levels, U.S. construction activity, demand for finished steel products, the expected capabilities and benefits of new facilities, the company's future operations, the timeline for execution of the company's growth plan, the company's future results of operations, financial measures, and capital spending. These and other similar statements are considered forward-looking and may involve certain assumptions and speculation and are subject to risks and uncertainties that could cause the actual results to differ materially from these expectations. These statements reflect the company's beliefs based on current conditions but are subject to certain risks and uncertainties including those that are described in the risk factors and forward-looking statement sections of the company's latest annual report on Form 10-K. Although these statements are based on management's current expectations and beliefs, CMC offers no assurance that these expectations or beliefs will prove to be correct and actual results may vary materially. All statements are made only as of this date, Except as required by law, CMC does not assume any obligation to update, amend, or clarify these statements in connection with the future events, changes in assumptions, occurrence of anticipated or unanticipated events, new information or circumstances, or otherwise. Some numbers presented will be non-GAAP financial measures and reconciliations for such numbers can be found in the company's earning release supplemental slide presentation or on the company's website. Unless stated otherwise, all references made to year or quarter and our references to the company's fiscal year or fiscal quarter. And now for opening remarks and introductions, I will turn the call over to Chairman of the Board, President and Chief Executive Officer of Commercial Metals Company, Ms. Barbara Smith. Please go ahead. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining CMC's first quarter earnings conference call. Hopefully, each of you had a wonderful holiday season. As we reported in our press release issued this morning, the first quarter of fiscal 2022 was another outstanding period with record consolidated and segment results. I'd like to thank CMC's 11,000 employees for their continued hard work and focused efforts on behalf of our customers and stakeholders. And we thank our customers for their continued trust in and partnership with CMC. I will begin today's call with a few highlights from the quarter and commentary on CMC's strategic growth projects. Paul Lawrence will then cover the quarter's financial information in more detail, and I will conclude with a discussion of the current market environment and our outlook for the second quarter of fiscal 2022, after which we will open the call to questions. Before starting my prepared remarks, I'd like to direct listeners to the supplemental slides that accompany this call. The presentation can be found on CMC's Investor Relations website. I'm pleased to report that CMC's first quarter fiscal 2022 earnings were the best in our company's 106-year history. Earnings from continuing operations were $232.9 million, or $1.90 per diluted share, on net sales of $2 billion, excluding the impact of a tax benefit related to an international reorganization, adjusted earnings from continuing operations were $199.2 million, or $1.62 per diluted share. CMC generated core EBITDA 
of $326.8 million, an increase of 109% from the year-ago period, and an improvement of 28% from the prior quarter. This was the third consecutive quarter in which our company has reported record bottom-line earnings, core EBITDA, and segment-level EBITDA. These achievements are a result of the execution of our strategic plans presented to shareholders during our virtual investor day in August of 2020. As noted in the press release, this very strong first quarter performance brings CMC's trailing 12-month core EBITDA to nearly $1 billion and return on invested capital to 18.3%. Strong market conditions and strong margins across several product lines certainly contributed to these exceptional results. However, to put this performance into context, during the fiscal 2014 and 2015 time period, we experienced similar robust market conditions to what we enjoy today, and our 12-month EBITDA was between 375 and 400 million, with return on invested capital in the mid-single digits. This significant improvement over the past six years underscores the enhanced earnings power of CMC today, and it is our objective to produce better returns with higher highs and lower lows through the economic cycle. To back up this statement, CMC achieved an annualized return on invested capital of 25.1% during the first quarter and an annualized return on equity of 35.6%. Our team members continue to tightly manage controllable costs, reflecting changes to costs on a per-unit basis better than most industry and macro benchmarks we track. We are certainly proud of CMC's record financial results delivered by strong execution of our strategic initiatives, as well as solid market fundamentals. While we are proud of the performance to date, let me take a moment to explain why I believe CMC's best days are still ahead of us. I'll start with sustainability. Before we can responsibly talk about growth, we need to be certain that what we are growing is sustainable. CMC was founded 106 years ago as a metals recycler, and we carry on that legacy today, operating possibly the cleanest portfolio of steel mills in the world. We're also committed to further improvement as we make significant progress towards our 2030 environmental goals. CMC's Scope 1 and 2 emissions are already well under the 2040 Paris Accord target, and our emissions have improved by 6.2% per ton of steel produced compared to our fiscal 2019 baseline. This two-year improvement stands in stark contrast to the global industry, which increased its emissions intensity over the same time frame. Since fiscal 2019, We've also improved our energy efficiency by 7.8%, while the global industry's performance has deteriorated by nearly 6%. We are sourcing more renewable energy than ever before, and the proportion of green energy within our overall consumption has risen by roughly three percentage points over the last two years. And we continue to work every angle to move this figure higher. Our commitment to renewable sourcing is demonstrated by the design of our future Arizona 2 micromill, now under construction in Mesa. This exciting new plant will be capable of directly connecting to an on-site solar field, making micromill steelmaking, the world's cleanest steelmaking technology, even cleaner. In our industry, sustainability also means treating our people with the right way and keeping them safe on the job. CMC's mission is that each day, every one of our employees finishes their shift in the same condition they started. We have developed a unique safety culture that leans on innovative thinking, emphasizes shared accountability, and aims toward an ultimate goal of zero incidents. Through this approach, CMC has achieved several consecutive years of improvement in our incident rates including dramatic improvements at acquired facilities where we have instilled our CMC culture. Across each line of business, 
we focus extensively at keeping our people safe and healthy. Not only is this the right thing to do, but over the long term, we expect the care we have for our employees will lead to long-term retention of our exceptional workforce and make CMC an employer of choice within our industry. I've touched on only a few highlights of our ESG commitment, which is detailed in our sustainability report published in December 2021, and I encourage you to read the report. To sum up, I would say that CMC is not just sustainable, but a sustainability leader. Being a leader means always pushing further and never standing still. In the years ahead, we will do just that, and clearly sustainable, our clearly sustainable platform gives us a solid foundation on which to grow. I'd like to now discuss some of our exciting initiatives, which are a result of the disciplined and deliberate execution of CMC's strategic plan. These projects strengthen and reinforce our organization's core capabilities while extending CMC's growth runway into markets, customer groups, and applications we already know well. Recently, we announced a series of exciting growth initiatives which have been under consideration for some time. I'd like to emphasize that we have been disciplined in knowing the strategic direction and goals that most benefit our shareholders, disciplined in taking the next step in identifying opportunities that move our organization towards these goals, and then acting decisively when these opportunities arise and the timing is right. Let me begin with an update on CMC's third micromill currently under construction in Mesa, Arizona. This plant will be the first micromill in the world capable of producing merchant bar and, as I mentioned earlier, will be among the greenest in the world. Arizona too, as we are calling it, provides significant strategic value to CMC. It will replace the much higher cost and inefficient rebar capacity of the former Steel California operation, the sale of which will fund over half the cost of our new plant. Arizona too will also give CMC a coast-to-coast -coast merchant bar footprint and serve several customers we already know well through our MBQ operations in Alabama, South Carolina, and Texas. Importantly, Arizona too will help further optimize CMC's operational network and enhance customer service. We are equally excited about CMC's fourth micro mill announced this morning. The new mill, dubbed MM4, will augment our operational footprint in the eastern United States and enhance our ability to serve markets in the Northeast, Mid-Atlantic, and Midwest. We expect significant internal synergies from this investment, including enhanced production flexibility among our eastern U.S. mill network, improved customer service capabilities, as well as enhanced delivery times and logistical efficiencies in getting steel to its destination. MM4 is a project we have studied for several years and now feel the time is right to execute. MM4 will be rebar-centric, with additional capabilities under consideration. As stated in the press release, a competitive site selection process is now underway and we will provide an update when the search is finalized. This investment further demonstrates our commitment to a sustainable future for CMC. Both mill projects stand to benefit directly from the largest infrastructure package to be enacted in the U.S. in several decades. The Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act signed last November will provide $1.2 trillion in funding over five years and stimulate an estimated 1 to 1.5 million tons of incremental annual rebar demand at full run rate. This would add roughly 15% to current domestic consumption of around 8.5 million tons. We expect the time between the bill's enactment and the commencement of significant construction activity to be in the range of 18 to 24 months, which lines up very well with the scheduled future commissioning of Arizona too. We further anticipate a late calendar 2024, early 2025 startup of MM4, and this would coincide with infrastructure-related demand nearing full run rate. Stepping beyond mill investments, CMC's agreement to acquire Tensar Corporation, announced last month, will add additional products and capabilities, which
which will make CMC a unique provider of value-added reinforcement solutions for the domestic and international construction market. This transaction represents CMC's entry into an adjacent and complementary product space through the purchase of a proven market and innovation leader. The acquisition meaningfully extends CMC's growth runway and provides a platform for further expansion into high-margin, high-customer-service engineered solutions. As we discussed in our call in December, Tensar's offerings provide best-in-class value propositions to customers, particularly against competing traditional reinforcing solutions, but are underpenetrated in the marketplace. We believe this combination of attractiveness to customers and large potential market opportunity will support significant organic growth at Tensar in the years ahead. Tensar is already very well managed with a strong reputation and proven innovation and operational capability. We believe these factors greatly reduce the execution risk of this transaction while providing CMC with solid commercial synergy opportunities out of the gate. Currently, we expect to close on the, the acquisition during the fiscal third quarter. The two U.S. mill expansions plus the Tensar acquisition combined with our recently commissioned rolling line in Europe should provide CMC with at least $200 million of sustainable through the cycle EBITDA once fully operational. My belief that CMC's best days are ahead is based not just on our announced strategic investments, but several other factors as well, including the quality of our people. We've not discussed this topic much in the past, but it's vitally important to the future of CMC with a longer-term impact greater than any new capital project. As we sit here today, I'm very confident regarding the new generation of leaders that are developing at every level of our organization. Our bench strength has never been better. CMC's transformational growth projects over the last several years have expanded our North American business by nearly 50%, necessitating organizational adjustment to accommodate such rapid growth. Employees were provided with opportunities to take on new responsibilities and new roles across the company, giving each an expanded perspective of CMC's business and valuable experience in managing through change. Additionally, the last two years have involved unprecedented challenges, first related to complications due to the pandemic, followed by high inflation, logistical issues, and labor shortages. Our team has responded exceptionally well to the series of challenges, and we have all seen the outcome a stronger company generating record financial results. With hindsight, it's clear the events of the last several years has created an innovative, adaptable, stress-tested roster of current and future key leaders at CMC. Lastly, and while this is outside CMC's control, I'm confident about the future of our core geographical markets. CMC has exposure to the most economically vibrant, and rapidly growing regions in both the U.S. and Europe. For more than a decade, population growth within CMC's key U.S. markets have outpaced the broader United States. This trend has picked up pace considerably since early 2020 and has been reflected in new community formation and relocation of businesses. Ultimately, population drives construction over the long term and CMC is well positioned to benefit. Finally, as stated in our press release, the Board of Directors declared a quarterly cash dividend of 14 cents per share of CMC common stock for stockholders of record on January 20th, 2022. The dividend will be paid on February 3rd, 2022. This represents CMC's 229th consecutive quarterly dividend with the amount paid per share increasing 17% from a year ago. As we announced last quarter, we are also committed to returning capital to shareholders through our share repurchase program, and Paul will give you an update on our activity this past quarter. With that as an overview, I'll now turn the discussion over to Paul Lawrence, Senior Vice President and Chief Financial Officer, to provide some more comments on the results for the quarter. Thank you, Barbara, and good morning to everyone on the call today. 
As Barbara noted, we reported record fiscal first quarter 2022 earnings from continuing operations of 232.9 million or $1.90 per diluted share, more than triple prior year levels of 63.9 million and 53 cents respectively. Results this quarter include a net after-tax benefit of 33.7 million primarily related to a tax capital loss recognition on an international tax restructuring transaction which took place in the quarter. Excluding the impact of this item, the adjusted earnings from continuing operations were $199.2 million, or $1.62 per diluted share. Core EBITDA from continuing operations was sorry, $326.8 million for the first quarter of 2022 more than double the $156.6 million generated during the prior year period. Slide 9 of the supplemental presentation illustrates the strength of CMC's quarterly results. Both our North America and Europe segments contributed significantly to year-over-year -year earnings growth, while core EBITDA per ton of finished steel reached a record level of $233 per ton. The first quarter marked the 11th consecutive quarter in which CMC generated an annualized return on invested capital at or above 10%, which is in excess of our cost of capital. Now I will review our results by segment for the first quarter of fiscal 22. The North American segment recorded adjusted EBITDA of $268.5 million for the quarter, an all-time high. This compares to adjusted EBITDA of $155.6 million in the same period last year. The largest driver of this 73% improvement was a significant increase in margins on steel products and raw materials. Partially offsetting this benefit were higher controllable costs on a per ton of finished steel basis due primarily to increased unit pricing for freight, energy, and alloys. Selling prices for steel products for our mills increased by $364 per ton on a year-over-year -year basis and $76 per ton sequentially. Margin over scrap on steel products increased $202 per ton from a year ago and $82 per ton sequentially. The average selling price of downstream products increased by $158 per ton from the prior year, reaching $1,092. This increase was consistent with the rise in underlying scrap costs, resulting in unchanged margins over scrap relative to the prior period. During our fourth quarter earnings call, I indicated that CMC's downstream backlog was expected to reprice higher throughout fiscal 2022, as new higher price work replaces older lower price work. Through the first four months of the fiscal year, we are seeing the anticipated rate of repricing play out. We continue to expect forward, further upward movement in CMC's average backlog price through the remainder of the fiscal year, particularly in light of strong market demand and bid volume, which we are experiencing in our downstream geographies. Shipments of finished product in the first quarter were essentially flat from a year ago. End market demand for our mill products remained strong. This is supported by our own shipment volume and industry-wide data we track regarding consumption of rebar, merchant bar, and wire rod. Downstream product shipments increased by nearly 8% from the prior period, driven by the beneficial impact of our growing construction backlog. Turning to slide 11 of the supplemental deck, our Europe segment generated record adjusted EBITDA of $79.8 million for the first quarter of 2022 compared to adjusted EBITDA of $14.5 million in the prior year period. This improvement was driven by expanded margins over scrap, the receipt of a $15.5 million energy credit, and strong profit contributions from our new rolling line. Higher costs for energy and milk consumables partially offset these positive factors. Energy credit received was for calendar 2020. Legislation is currently before the Polish Parliament to extend this credit further. 
Margins over scrap increased $236 per ton on a year-over-year -year basis, and we're up $120 per ton from the prior quarter. Tight market conditions provided the backdrop to achieve the segment's highest average selling price in more than a decade, reaching $869 per ton during the first quarter. This level represented an increase of $408 per ton compared to a year ago, and $106 per ton sequentially. Europe volumes declined 8% compared to the prior year as a result of extensive planned maintenance performed at our rebar rolling line. Shipments of merchant and other products were relatively unchanged as sales of higher margin finished products replaced sales of semi-finished billets. <clears throat> Demand conditions within Central Europe remain strong. The Polish construction market continues to grow at a robust rate, with particular strength in the residential and infrastructure sectors. Construction of our merchant and wire rod, consumption of our merchant and wire rod products has been supported by expanding manufacturing activity, as highlighted by several key macroeconomic indicators, including the Polish and German PMI readings and Polish new industrial orders. The combination of good demand and strong pricing has provided an ideal backdrop for the start of our third rolling line. This new asset is significantly outperforming the original investment case. Turning to capital allocation, balance sheet, and liquidity, as of November 30th, 2021, cash and cash equivalents totaled $415 million. In addition, we had approximately $650 million of availability under our credit and accounts receivable program, bringing total liquidity to nearly $1.1 billion. In addition, as we announced last week, in late December, we closed on the sale of our Rancho Cucamonga, California site and received gross proceeds of $313 million. Proceeds received represent approximately 45% of the entire purchase price of the rebar acquisition we completed in 2019. During the second quarter, we will record a pre-tax gain of approximately $275 million related to this transaction. During the quarter, we generated $26 million of cash from operating activities, despite a $252 million increase in working capital. The rise in working capital was driven by the increase in average selling prices. Looking beyond price factors, our days of working capital have decreased from a year ago. Over the course of the past four quarters, CMC has invested roughly $500 million in working capital. Our leverage metrics remain attractive and have improved significantly over the last two fiscal years. As can be seen on slide 15, our net debt to EBITDA ratio now sits at just 0.7 times, while our net debt to capitalization is 18%. We believe our robust balance sheet and overall financial strength provides us the flexibility to finance our strategic organic growth projects and complete the acquisition of Tensar while continuing to return cash to shareholders. CMC's effective tax rate was 11%, which was driven sharply below our typical statutory rates by the international reorganization performed during the quarter. Absent the enactment of any corporate tax legislation that would impact fiscal 2022, we forecast our tax rate to be approximately 25 to 26% for the balance of the year. With respect to CMC's fiscal 2022 capital spending outlook, we currently expect to invest 475 to 525 million this year, roughly half of which will be attributable to Arizona 2. Lastly, after approving the program in mid-October, CMC repurchased 159,500 shares during the first fiscal quarter of 2022 at an average price of 33.28 per share. These transactions amounted to approximately 5.3 million, leaving 344 million remaining under the current authorization. We expect share buyback activity to increase in the second half of the year. With that, this concludes my remarks, and I'll turn it back to Barbara for her comments and the outlook for the uh, balance of the year. Thank you, Paul.
Turning now to market conditions, first in North America. We are seeing strong activity within nearly all of our end markets. At the mill level, demand for rebar, merchant bar, and wire rod remains robust with total domestic consumption for each of these products growing on a year-over-year -year basis during CMC's fiscal first quarter. Rebar and wire rod in particular are being supported by continued construction growth. During CMC's first quarter, total domestic construction spending increased roughly 10% from the prior year according to the U.S. Census Bureau, driven by growth in both residential and private non-residential categories. While national spending was largely unchanged for infrastructure, activity within CMC's core geographies outperformed the national average during the first quarter, driven by healthier state-level budgets and the need to accommodate growing populations with expanded infrastructure networks. Strength in construction activity has also benefited our merchant bar product lines, which are used in various applications, including ceiling joists, industrial stairs and railings, and warehouse racking. The industrial markets served by CMC's merchant products are healthy, and we are seeing particular strength among machinery and equipment manufacturers. As you know, construction is by far CMC's largest end market, and our best leading indicator is our volume of downstream project bids. Activity levels have been very strong for the last three quarters, driven by a good blend of private and public sector work. Project owners are also awarding high volumes of new work, which has allowed CMC to grow our downstream backlog on a year-over-year -year basis for two consecutive quarters. Work is entering our backlog at very attractive average price levels, which we expect to drive profitability when shipped in future quarters. The picture is equally positive in Europe. Construction activity is strong with new residential construction permits increasing by double-digit percentages on a year-over-year -year basis. The Central European industrial sector continues to grow, as reflected in the current 18-month trend of expansionary PMI readings for both Poland and Germany. With production from our new rolling line, which allows our Polish operations to produce each of our three major product groups simultaneously, CMC is now even better positioned to capitalize on this growth. In addition, supply conditions in Central Europe are tight, which has, given, has driven margins sharply upward from the historical lows of fiscal 2020 and early fiscal 2021. Regarding our outlook for fiscal 2022, we remain confident. Based on our view of the marketplace and our internal indicators, we anticipate continued strong financial performance. Signs point to robust demand in our key end markets and we expect supply and demand conditions to remain favorable, supporting healthy margin levels. The positive tone of our outlook is backed up by several key external construction forecasts and indicators. The Portland Cement Association once again increased its expectation for cement consumption growth in 2022, and now anticipates an increase of 2.5% on a year-over-year -year basis. The Architectural Billing Index continues to point toward expansion in the year ahead, particularly within our core southern U.S. footprint. Additionally, the Dodge Momentum Index, which measures the value of non-residential projects entering the planning phase, remains near a 14-year high and shows strength in both its commercial and institutional components. More near term, in the second quarter of fiscal 2022, we expect shipments to follow a typical seasonal trend, which is historically equated to a modest decline from Q1 levels. Margins on steel products, as well as controllable cost per ton, should be generally consistent on a quarter over quarter basis. Once again, I'd like to thank all of the CMC employees for delivering yet another quarter of outstanding performance. Thank you, and at this time, we will now open the call to questions. We will now begin the question and answer session. To ask a question, you may press star, then one on your touchstone phone. If you're using a speakerphone, please pick up your handset before pressing the keys. 
If at any time your question has been addressed and you would like to withdraw your question, please press star then 2. Please limit yourself to one question and one follow-up. If you have further questions, you may re-enter the question queue. At this time, we will pause momentarily to assemble our roster. Our first question comes from Satish Kasinathan with Deutsche Bank. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Happy New Year and uh, thanks for taking my questions. Uh, my first question is on the announced uh, new micro mill. Uh, you mentioned that it will be rebar centric and that you are looking to add uh, MBQ capability. Uh, but can you provide any rough estimate on the size and capex for the mill? Yeah, Satish, I, I think until we conclude our um, all of our analysis and our site selection, um, we're not we're not prepared to um, give further specifics on that. But I think if you look at our track record with our our um, other micro mills, you know we will we will be very disciplined in the way we look at the market and and. Um, you know, we'll come back to you as soon as we can with more specifics around uh, the CapEx needs. Okay, thanks for the color. Uh, and uh, my second question is on the funding for the Tensor acquisition. Um, now that you had a little more time to explore your options, any initial thoughts on what the mix of uh, debt or cash would be? Yeah, good, uh, good morning, Satish. Um, you know, we, we benefit from a very strong balance sheet that we uh, that we have, and so um, as we work towards closing, which uh, Barbara outlined will be uh, likely in the uh, the third fiscal quarter, um, we will uh, take uh, stock and, and leverage that strength of the balance sheet to uh, to make sure we fund uh, the, the the growth project in a uh, in an efficient manner. Um, so at this stage, we have not uh, determined exactly what that will be, but we have a lot of uh, tools in the toolbox to uh, to get that done well. Okay. Uh, congrats on a great quarter. Thank you. Thanks, Tish. Thank you. Our next question comes from Tim Nathaniels with Wolf Research. Please go ahead. Yeah, hey, Happy New Year, everyone. Happy New Year, Tim. Um, I just wanted to ask two questions. Um, one on the new mill. You know, in the past, you've really flagged the um, importance of your southern base and the specific growth in that region. So I just want a little more color on why the east coast or Midwest, and if you're concerned about any um, greater exposure to imports there. Um, and the second question is just about volumes in the quarter. I thought they were a bit light. Just wanted to understand that and if that still implies a decline into the Feb quarter as per traditional. Thanks. Thank you, Timna. Um, you know, a couple comments on on the new mill. I think um, we have had a traditional southern, uh, primarily southern exposure, but uh, following the the acquisition of a few years ago, that really rounded out our our footprint and and opened us up to um, take advantage of a very very high consuming. Uh, rebar market in the in the Northeast, and as as you know well, the infrastructure bill that that was passed, something that has been you know talked about for probably the last ten years that I've been here at CMC, is going to create an enormous amount of additional demand, and you know we think the timing of this is is perfect to take advantage of that. In addition to all the other benefits that come with upgrading the technology, you know, we clearly have a commitment to green technology. This this micro mill technology is the most efficient in the world, um, and it and with it comes all kinds of quality and customer benefits. So, it this is very consistent with. Um, you know our, our long-term strategy to make sure that we have we employ the the latest technology in in the industry, which happens to also be the greenest technology in the world. And you know the infrastructure bill that's that's coming is um, going to fully support the the offtake of this new investment. 
Oh, and then you had the question around volume. You want to take that one, Paul? Yeah, sure. So, Tim, no, with respect to, to volumes, um, I'll start with, uh, with, with Europe. Um, as, uh, as I mentioned, Europe had a um, significant outage in, in one of its mills that was a planned maintenance outage, um, and that drove much of the, uh, the, the, the reduction in, in volume. So uh, we do expect that uh, uh, you know, quarter over quarter sequentially we will not follow the, the normal seasonal trend of, of lowest uh, shipments in the, uh, in the fiscal second quarter, but in fact uh, we'll probably see a modest uh, uptick to, to volumes in the, uh, in the second quarter in, in Poland. In North America, uh, the, uh, the total finished uh, volumes, if we add both the uh, steel product volumes as well as downstream uh, products, were essentially flat to a year ago period. Um, there was a shift between um, uh, you know, mill steel product shipments to, to downstream as we uh, enhanced our, our backlog and shipped more internally. But overall, uh, the volume was essentially uh, flat to where we were a year ago, and and somewhat impacted by uh, the uh, the holiday season, the beginning of the holiday season, as well as some maintenance outages that uh, uh, we had during the uh, during the quarter. Um, with respect to North America, we do expect a, a traditional um, uh, seasonal downswing in in volumes uh, of of the total steel product and downstream groupings into the uh, to the second quarter aligned to normal and, and that would be generally or down around 5% uh, from where we were in the uh, in the first quarter and that's just primarily related to uh, uh, the the extended holidays over the Christmas period Gotcha. And then I'm sorry on the on the question on the Midwest and the or the East Coast mill, I had snuck in a question about if that opens you up more to imports or if that's a concern. Would you mind um, answering that part, please? Yeah, it's in the. I mean, you're well aware of where the major importing locations are, and I think that we our assessment is we're going to enjoy a pretty favorable import environment even with the adjustments that have been made um, you know to the the European situation it's it's always a risk but we um, monitor that carefully and again I point back to our track record of introducing the micro mill the the, the benefits of that uh, technology and quality and, and cost um, every time we've we've uh, built a new mill, it has started up and been been full. So between the infrastructure plan and the benefits of the technology, uh, we we don't see a major factor there. And the fact that um, I think we're going to enjoy a favorable import environment uh, foreseeable future. Thanks. And by America probably helps also. Yep. Absolutely. All right, thank you. Thank you, Timna. As a reminder, if you have a question, please press star then one to be joined into the queue. Our next question comes from Seth Rosenfall with Exane BNP Paribas. Please go ahead. Good afternoon. Um, thanks for taking our questions today. I can ask another question, please, with the new East Coast mill. You touched on earlier potential for some synergies and operating efficiencies. Are you able to give us any uh, tangible examples of what you're looking at on the operating efficiency side, perhaps quantify any scale of synergies that would make this investment particularly attractive versus what we've seen on a standalone Greenville asset in the past, please? I'll start there. Thank you. Yeah, Seth, uh, Happy New Year. Hope, hope uh, you are doing well. Um, you know, I think, again, I I just point back to our track record and, you know, we're always evaluating the long-term capital needs of existing capacity balanced with, um, you know, upgrading to a more current and new technology. And um, if you look at when we did, when we did the analysis, 
um, it was it was economically more attractive to go ahead and invest in this new technology that's going to be a lot more efficient, cost-effective, higher quality, lower um, environmental impact than reinvesting in the older legacy technology. The other factor we always evaluate is market demand. And, you know, as I, I indicated earlier, um, the demand today is, is very robust and, you know, the markets are, I will say, in a sold out condition. And when you layer on the additional investment that's going to be made over the coming five, seven, ten years, the, it, it, between the market analysis and that economic equation, um, this, that makes this project very attractive. Okay, thank you. Um, I guess a separate question, please, with regards to fabrication pricing. I believe in your prepared remarks you commented that you expect backlog prices to increase throughout the coming fiscal year. Uh, given that I think in the past fab pricing has often been set kind of with reference to steel cost, is that comment uh, a sign of confidence that spot rebar prices could continue increasing or rather call on the unique kind of supply-demand dynamic for fab itself, just improving the pricing for fabrication, please? Beth, I'll start, and then Barbara can add uh, some some comments. And you know, as you, as you uh, are aware and know our business well, you know, essentially the fab pricing is is uh, is based when the when the uh, the contract is awarded at a price over and above you know typical uh, rebar pricing. And as we you know look throughout uh, last year, you know, rebar pricing increased. Uh, you know, north of, of $300 a, uh, a ton. And while we saw a, a nice repricing of the, uh, of the backlog during the, uh, the, 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 the first quarter, uh, we're, we're still uh, lagging the overall increase in, in what we're shipping um, because of the older, uh, older contracts that remain in, in our backlog. So we do anticipate uh, that the based on the, the bid activity that we are seeing today, which is very strong, that we'll continue to uh, uh, see strong rebar pricing and, and as a result continue to see uh, new work going into our backlog that is uh, uh, reflective of these, these higher price uh, contracts that, uh, uh, that we're seeing today. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Seth. Our next question comes from Andrea Bockenheiser with UBS. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. Hope you are all uh, safe. Happy New Year. Uh, just two quick questions from me. Um, can, can you just give us a little bit more clarity on how you look at the overall cost outlook uh, for 2022? Um, obviously, on the scrap side, maybe also on the energy side. Um, obviously, there are always some voices in the in the market talking about higher scrap prices for longer, and, and, and obviously there's a little bit of an energy crunch going on. So, you know, to what extent, if at all, you are uh, impacted by any of this and how you're kind of looking at 2022 um, is my first question. Um, and my second question, um, assuming for a moment it's, it's going to be another stellar year, year for you guys on the margin side, um, do, do you have a preference for uh, buybacks over dividends? How, how should we think about that from a capital allocation uh, point of view? Uh, thank you very much. Those are the two questions. Thank you. I'll begin, and then Paul can, you know, maybe give a little more guidance um, if if you're looking for a modeling question. You know, clearly there's all sorts of inflationary pressures out there, and um, you know what what I would say is the market is absorbing those inflationary pressures, and at the same time, we're trying to manage uh, our own cost structure. To, with an objective to um, to have our inflation be less than what you would look at in terms of an overall market inflation number. And I think our, our results would bear out that we've done a really good job of 
you know, using productivity to offset some of those inflationary pressures, but the strong market um, is allowing um, those the inflation to be passed through. And I would remind you know that that um, the pressures that we're seeing is are not not any too different than than everyone else in the marketplace. Uh, if you get down to individual line items, and I'm going to probably turn the turn this over to Paul to give specifics. Um, you know, there are some components of the cost structure where the inflation seems to be moderating, and then there's other elements of the cost structure where we may see some continued uh, pressure on inflation. You know, as it relates to scrap, scrap ebbs and flows throughout the year, um, and ebbs and flows based on, you know, market uh, demand and tightness and whether or not scrap is moving offshore and, and not. Uh, unlike, um, you know, a lot of other steel products, other than our fab backlog, you know, we really are in the market on a spot basis, and so our products are able to uh, absorb those fluctuations, uh, and we see, you know, just continued strength in, in demand as, um, as the primary factor that's going to help preserve our, our metal margins going forward. From my perspective, as it relates to capital allocation, I think we were fairly clear in October, um, you know, when we took action on increasing both the dividend and reinitiating our share repurchase program. You know, that was a very healthy increase in the dividend and a, a meaningful repurchase uh, program that was put in place. And our board, you know, evaluates that on an ongoing basis and. Right now, we'll execute on that, and, and I'm sure at, at the right moment, we'll reevaluate it and see where we go from here. Andreas, I'll just add to your question with respect to energy specifically. You know, in, in Europe, uh, you know, the latter half of, of December, we certainly saw uh, energy levels come back down, and, and as a result, I think we're we're through the period of, of, of the peak that we saw uh, throughout much of the, uh, the, the, the fourth quarter of 2021. Um, and, uh, you know, there should be a lower, lower costs ahead. Now, we were sheltered from much of, of that increase in the spot pricing due to, A, we, you know, operating in Poland had uh, significantly lower cost energy than, than most other countries within Europe. As well, uh, of our, as as a result of our of our hedging arrangement, and I guess to add a little bit of color to uh, to, to Barbara's uh, point, you know, if you look at where costs have had the the most impact to us, it's energy, it's freight, and it's uh, some of the long term uh, consumables that we uh, we we use in our business. You know, energy, as we've seen in in, uh, in in our Polish operations, the hedging and activity that we have there to mitigate some of these price spikes certainly have helped. Uh, we have a fairly significant fleet of, of our own rail and, and uh, tractor trailers uh, that help uh, with respect to some of the challenges on the logistics front uh, here in the uh, in in the U.S. And so that helps with some of the inflation that we're seeing there. And, and finally, with respect to some of the consumables, we've prided ourselves with, with contracts that we have in place with, uh, uh, with our suppliers, which again, allow us to manage those costs and um, ultimately have greater visibility to, uh, to those costs. And certainly, you know, as, as some of the, uh, the industry, principally the hot roll, uh, sort of slows down, its production rates, we would expect to see some of those rates to uh, to dissipate in the uh, in the alloy area. So, overall, uh, competitively speaking, I think we're we're in, in in good shape with respect to the key areas that have seen inflation this year. That's uh, that's very clear. I appreciate the, uh, the the detailed answer. Thank you very much. Stay safe. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, you Andrea. as well. Our next question comes from Phil uh, Gibbs with KeyBank Capital Markets. Please go ahead. Hey, good morning. 
Morning, Phil. Phil. The the Tensar acquisition expected to close in your third fiscal quarter. That's going to be, uh, I think, the biggest acquisition after you know, after their Gerdau one and, and, and pretty sizable in terms of um, you know the platform. Is there more uh, you know M and A that that you have your your eyes on as you you grow the company? Yeah, thank you, Phil. As as you know, you you've been around a long time. You know, we're not going to give any specifics as it relates to um, potential targets, but we've worked hard to reposition the portfolio and to have a balance sheet that is impeccable and and allows us a lot of flexibility. And clearly, we we believe that the addition of Tensar opens up the opportunity to think about some, some other things. And so we would look at it as another avenue for, for growth. Our first objective is to, to get the acquisition closed and fully integrated and to, to reap the benefits of, of the acquisition. But already we are, to the extent we can, um, interacting with the team as we await the regulatory approval. Uh, we are finding uh, more and more situations where we, we both are working on the same job sites and where we have worked together in the past on, on projects. And so we're just really excited to get across the finish line and get it closed so we can um, really dig into those commercial opportunities that that will no doubt exist, and the timing will be really attractive. You know, as I indicated earlier, with the with the infrastructure bill, uh, we think that that'll be you know um, just a, a great time for us to be taking this on, and um, we really look forward to where we can go from there. But we're always screening things, and we, um, you know, we we see a lot of, of opportunity on the horizon. You know, I I know the deal hasn't closed yet, but regarding Tensar, is there is there a likelihood that you're going to um, ha have to put more capital into that business as you as you grow it, or or as you see fit with with infrastructure and new capacity? Um, you know, it's on top of the 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 amount of capital that you're putting down to buy the business. Yeah, interestingly enough, Phil, um, you know, one of the things that was attractive about the Tensar business to us is the the higher margins available because it is more of an engineered solution, and there is a heavy technology R and D component to it. But secondarily, the lower capital intensity. Uh, we believe the footprint that uh, exists within Tensar has, you know, sufficient ability to expand and increase the output to meet the, you know, the demand in the foreseeable future. But if the demand exceeds even our expectations, the investment needed to add manufacturing um, is order of magnitude less on an initial investment than um, you know what you think of in our in our traditional steel making footprint. Thanks so much. I look forward to uh, learning more about the business with time. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, Phil. At this time, there appears to be no further questions. Ms. Smith, I'll now turn the call back over to you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us on today's conference call. We look forward to speaking with many of you during our investor calls in the coming days and weeks. And um, once again, Happy New Year, and look forward to speaking with you sometime soon. Have a great day. This concludes today's Commercial Metals Company conference call. You may now disconnect.